Alright, so I'm getting ready to wrap some reeds and some of the tools that I need is this piece that's called an easel and it has an etch mark about halfway through that shows me where the halfway point of my cane will be. I'll be using this, it's called a shaper handle and a shaper tip and the tip part which is this right here is interchangeable and I've got another one that um, I can also use. They're a little bit different sizes but they do the base, same basic function of shaping the cane into the dimensions that I want. Um, so I've got my cane soaking here and it's been soaking for about an hour. Um, and there's really no science to how long it needs to soak. So some pieces may be over soaked, some pieces may be under soaked. And basically what I do is I put it on the easel just like that and then I take my pencil and I mark where that halfway point is just on the edges so that I can see where that's at. And then I will take my knife which I'll be using this one. It's called a double hollow ground knife because when you look at it it's equal on both sides whereas with a beveled knife it's a different shape. You've got the angle there at the side and for doing this I don't want the straight side and the the angled part and want the the equal shade. So once I've got that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take that cane and where I marked the halfway points, I'm going to balance it on the blade and just push that cane down so that it folds in half. So that's the first step. Once I am done with that, I'll be putting it on the shaper tip and with this cane it's too wide for the shaper tip so what I'm actually going to have to do is make it a little bit narrow so I'll straighten it back out. I'll take a razor blade and just very carefully, see which side I want to use here, very carefully take off some of that width all the way down the cane and take off about the same amount from the other side because we want to keep everything as symmetrical as possible. That way it gives us a nice even and steady good shape for a reed. And just check the thickness on that with the cane. Still got to go a little bit thinner. So I'll take off a little bit more. check it because if we go too thin then you know we also don't want that we just want to be just right and I need to go just a little bit thinner we're almost there and the kind of cane that's used is not bamboo like a lot of people think it's actually a variety of cane that's called Arundo Donax and the cane that I'm using is actually grown in Argentina on, or, on, on, on an organic farm. And it's the kind of cane that I've found that I like the best. Almost there, just a little bit more. So this should be pretty close to exactly right. And so then the way that I get this to stay on the shaper handle is I've got a little knob here that I make sure is loosened. I bring the little arms all the way up. So that sandwiches the cane right between the two. Make sure it's nice and even on both sides and then just tighten that screw back up to hold them in place. It's like two little clamps that just hold it onto that shaper tip. Make sure it's nice and tight because we don't want that cane to move because if it moves then it won't be symmetrical and we won't get a very good outcome. So then it's on the shaper tip and you can see that there's quite a bit of cane hanging off on the sides. And so what I'll do is I'll just take that razor blade and follow the shaper tip. So it's got these little ears on it that stick up so that you can kind of see the guide. And I'll just take it and scrape towards me. 
and make a nice big mess everywhere so that it matches the profile on that one side. I'll flip it over and do the same thing to the other side. The shape that I'm using is a shape that's called Lucarelli and if you look my cane actually shifted a little bit but not a big deal. Just tighten it back up, make sure it stays right where we need it to. Not really sure why this isn't staying where it should be. So we'll just help it out a little bit. shapes the cane into the same profile as the shaper tip. So once I'm done with that, then I take it off of the shaper tip and handle and it just kind of pops right off. And what I'll do is I'm going to throw it back in some water so that way it stays nice and wet so when I use it for the next step it's all ready to go. And uh, when I do this I never do one piece at a time because it's way too kind way too time consuming to do um, just one at a time. So what I do is I usually do between six and eight and then hopefully I'll get a couple good reads out of that. If I'm really lucky all of them will work. So I've got all of my cane shaped and it all looks like this. Um, so they have been soaking in water while I've been working on them. Uh, the next step that I'm going to do is what's called tying. And for what, what I'll need for this is um, I'll need something called a mandrel. And I've got two different ones. I've got one that looks like this and one that looks like this. This one kind of has a blockier handle. Um, they're tapered at the ends, so they're kind of cone-shaped. And they're a little bit different sizes. Um, so what I'll be doing is on these, I've got things that are called staples or tubes. And it's the cork part that you see on an oboe reed. Um, and they fit just right on the mandrel handle so that I have something to hold on to when I'm tying them with the thread. Um, so I have mandrels, the staple, the cane, and then what I'm going to use to tie them is um, it's a thread. It's called double F thread and that's the thickness of the thread. Um, this happens to be, I think this is nylon, which is what most of them are made out of. Um, but I've got different colors this time. I'm going to use gold just because I haven't used it in a while. And uh, so what I'll do is I need a tape or a uh, ruler as well that has millimeters because nothing is done in inches because it's too large of a measurement. You need something that's really, really small. Um, so we're going to be using millimeters. And that's my left-handed one. Here's my right-handed one. The millimeters are on different sides, so it depends on how I'm holding the reed, which one I use. Um, so I start off with one strand. I've got um, seven cut here. And what I'll do is I will choose a mandrel that I want to use and a staple that I want to use. And I don't want to use that mandrel because it doesn't fit on there very well. Yep, good. Just double check the measurement of that staple so I know what I'm wrapping to. It's 47 millimeters. So when I get to 47 millimeters, I need to stop. And to prep my thread, I'm going to take some beeswax and just run it over the thread. Um, what that does is it gives it a nice coating so that when I'm done with the tying part of it, the beeswax will help seal the thread so that I don't I don't get any air leaks or anything like that. So it stays nice and um, tight and the air goes through and doesn't go out anywhere else. Um, so the cane goes right on the staple just like that. So we're starting to see the, the oboe reed shape show up here. And I tie it 72 millimeters so I make sure that the the very first millimeter is down there at the bottom of the staple and that the cane is um, the top of the cane is at 72 and that's good. Bring it down just a little bit more. Double check that measurement. Good. I want to make sure it's nice and straight on there because we don't want a, a crooked oboe reed. And a lot of people use um, the spool 
in their hand when they wrap. And for me that's just very awkward and it's not very comfortable. I just prefer to use it in my hand and just wrap the thread around my hand and cut off some circulation in the process. So I'm going to wrap two, three, four times, however many it takes to get to the end of that staple. And make sure it's pulled tight because we want that oboe reed to seal nice and tight so that there's no leaks. And all the while I'll be checking my measurements to make sure everything's where it needs to be. And then when I get to the top of that staple I come up really close and I'll take my thumbnail and press the cane so that it overlaps just a little bit. My fingernail is just a little long to do this safely so I have to be really careful. Once I get that done, I'm going to do the crossover. And so what that means is when I go to wrap the other way, I'm going to wrap over the, the wraps that I just did. And then continue on down, making sure that everything's nice and straight. There's no overlaps other word, other than where I want them. I'm not liking this wrap, so I'm just going to back it off a little bit. And move it up. where I want it. And do the same thing, make sure it's nice and straight. This time I can kind of see the end of the staple, so I kind of know where it's at. And double check everything again. There's the crossover. I'm going to continue wrapping it on down. And I've done this long enough that I kind of know how to wrap it and I know kind of what's going to be good and what's not going to be good. Um, and making sure there's no gaps in that thread. And the beeswax kind of makes it stick to your hand a little bit. It's a little interesting feeling because it doesn't slide. You go all the way down to the bottom of the middle part of the staple. When you get to the end, it looks pretty much like an oboe reed. When you get to the end, you're going to do what's called the tie-off. Uh, there's different ways to do this, and I like the first way that I was taught. And, oh, got to back up. Had a thread that overlapped itself. All the way almost at the top, not quite. It's on the back side of the reed and I couldn't see it. Not a big deal. Let's go back and fix it. Get that thread all nice and tight. Mm, much better. Alright, so I'm down at the bottom of that staple again, and uh, the tie-off is where I left off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an L with my left hand, and I'm going to put my first finger right where I just wrapped that thread. The thread is going to go under my thumb, over my first finger again, so I've got a nice little loop there. And then that thread, the tail end of the thread, is going to come through that oval that I just made between my fingers. And then place it exactly where you want it, because nobody likes a loosey-goosey thread. There's one knot, and I'm actually going to do two more just to make sure that everything's okay. Um, if I only do one knot and it happens to come loose, then the whole reed's going to fall apart. And that can be really frustrating, especially if um, you've only played it on a couple times or if you haven't yet played on it. So everything is nice and tight. Everything's wrapped off. It's not going to come apart because I've done three of the um, knots. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, um, it's actually a scalpel, like what they use for surgeries. And, uh, sorry, it's a little hard to see because of the light. And what I'm going to do is just cut that thread there at the base. And there where it's tied to the table. And now it's free. Um, throw away the extra, the extra thread because there's no, nothing I can use it for. We have... A nice little wrapped reed. We're nowhere close to being done. We're just in the, in the stages of what's called a blank. And it's called a blank because it's blank. There's no scrapes on it. It's just wrapped. Um, the next step that I do that um, 
is, uh, if you can see, there's um, like little ears. Um, how can I show you this? There's like little ears from when we shaped it that, um, here you go, that need to come off because otherwise it'd look a little silly being on a finished reed. So what I do is I just take my razor blade again and um, I actually hold the reed backwards and I'll just follow the profile of that cane and cut those ears off so that it's nice and straight and no extra funky shapes on this piece of cane. That one's a little deep but it should be okay. So there is our finished blank and what I'll do is I will um, finish wrapping the rest of these, put this off to dry so that it has time to hold its shape a little bit better and then I'll come back and do the third step. Alright, so um, I have all of the reeds tied and they've been sitting here drying for just a little bit. Um, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to do what's called um, starting the tip. And so you're going to start to see um, the shape of the tip of the oboe reeds start to come together. Um, what I'm doing over here off to the side is I'm just putting a little bit of water in my soaker container. Whoops. And it's basically, it's what it is, it's just a Tupperware cup um, that holds about two ounces. And uh, what I do is, um, when I need to soak the cane, but not the whole thing because we don't want the, the cork to get wet, um, I'll just put that in there and it'll soak up what I need it to. I try to keep them in order because um, I want them to all soak evenly. Um, I don't want something that I just finished wrapping and hasn't had a, a, enough time to um, rest um, to get done before one that's been waiting for quite a while. Uh, so here on my table I've uh, got a ruler so that I can just put my um, uh, wrapped blank there and mark exactly what I needed to and all it is is it's a ruler that has millimeters and centimeters and it's only as long as I need it to be because um, I don't I didn't want something that would take up so much room because I really don't need anything past about 80 millimeters um, or 8 centimeters for those of you who can't do that conversion yet um, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of my reeds that has been resting and they've all had the ears clipped off of them so they, they look like an oboe reed what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it down here on the table and line up the end of the staple with the millimeters marking there. And I'm marking about 65 millimeters um, right there in the center. And pencil doesn't really work too well on wet cane, but it works well enough. And I'm just drawing a basic shallow V shape. And I'll try to get a picture of that when I'm done here. So on the cane. See if I can there you can kind of see my pencil marking right there. Um, it's just a shallow V shape. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my knife. Alright, so I'm experiencing some dull knives and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sharpen them. Uh, this is called a um, fine India stone and I've actually got three different kinds of stones. I have a diamond stone which um, is extremely hard. I use it for when I'm doing basically a reset of my knives and it's got um, steel and then underneath it it's got some some passages that will collect the shaved off pieces of metal from the knife. Um, so I'm not going to be using that one right now because I don't need to reset my knives. I just need to hone them a little bit. Um, then I've got my fine Indian knife that I'm going to be using. And then the last one that I have that I don't use very often is a ceramic knife. And it's extremely heavy. It's basically a brick of rock. I mean, it, it's very, 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 very heavy. Um, very smooth. There's not a whole lot of, of grit to it. Um, with this one, it, you, can, you can feel the the raised parts of the of the block um and all you can also see on my fingers maybe underneath it where it's turned black those are pieces of metal that have been shaved off um they're not so big that they actually cut or hurt you it's just like um if you were to rub your fingers over um some pencil markings or whatever and then this one it's just there i haven't used it so there's not really a whole lot on it um 
but it is there if I ever do decide to use it. So the way that I sharpen my knives is this is the dull knife and this is the the um, sharpening stone and everything needs to be able to float away so I'm going to have a towel handy because I am going to be using some water. I've got my towel here that I can be ready to soak stuff up and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pour a little bit of water right there directly on the stone and it just sits right on top. It looks kind of cool in the, in the uh, camera there. And I'm just going to take my finger and I'm just going to slide it all over the place so that when I do get my knife on there, um, the water is all isn't just in one spot. And so the first thing I do is I'm going to take my knife and there's a front side and a back side. And the back side is what is facing me right now. Um, I've got a diagram here that helps me know what kind of strokes and where the pressure needs to be and the angle of the knife and all that good stuff. So basically I'm going to do eight strokes going this way and everything needs to keep very even on that stone. We don't want a really sharp place on our knife. One. And eight. And then I'm going to do the front side so you're going to get a get good close-up of my hand here. And we're going to go six strokes with pressure going towards the front. I'm going to slide some more of that water back over there so it's not all in the very end there. I'm going to do six strokes. One. Six. I'm going to do seven strokes back the other way. One. And then seven strokes this way. One. Seven. And I'm going to turn my block so that it's going big ways. I'm going to do four strokes doing this. One. Two. And I'm dripping water everywhere. Three. Four. And four strokes this way. One, two, three, four. And I'm gonna take it, lay it on its back so it's, there's no angle, and you just slide it straight across to give it a nice burr. The burr is the part of the knife that is, um, if you, if you were to zoom in on this with a microscope, you'd see that it goes down and then it has a little curl to it. And that curl is what grabs the cane and is able able for to let me push it off and it's grabbing my thumbnail quite nicely so hopefully that's that's sharp enough and then to get rid of this water that I have spilled all down everywhere I'm just gonna wipe it up with that rag and set it off to the side somewhere over there okay so it looks like I am ready to get back to working on these tips uh, try this again to see if I can get a better one here. Marking at 65 millimeters, just right in the center of that cane. Making a nice shallow V to give my gu my knife a, a guide. So I've got it marked on one side because if I put it on the other side, my finger is just going to rub it off. Line it up with that pencil mark. Oh, so much better. No gouges, it slides nice and easy. It's almost like um, if you have room temperature butter and you take a, a spoon, you can just kind of spoon through that butter, whereas if it was in the refrigerator, it's really hard and you can't do that. That's what this is like. It's just so easy. Um, and then do the other side to so get that V shape in there. There's so much more control when your knife is sharp because then you're not fighting it. You're just kind of letting it glide across the cane and you don't really get many gouges. Sometimes you get little hairline ones that are super easy and really don't make a difference on anything. There, so you can kind of see where the tip is starting to take shape. There's a little bit of a different discoloration between the two because you've taken off the shiny bark part and you're left with just the the uh, meat underneath. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to mark where the end of that hit right there on the side so I can see it when I flip it over. I can see where those edges are and I kind of know the angle of what my knife needs to be. Um, hold it up to the light. Oop. 
need to even that out just a little bit more. Mm, that's better. Alright, so I've got it marked on the sides. I know the angle that my knife needs to be. I'm just going to scrape it. You can see the little pieces flying off. That's the cane that I don't need that I'm taking off. It's basically kind of like when you have an ice sculpture. You just take off all the parts that don't look like what you want your sculpture to be. It's kind of the same thing. You take off all the parts that you don't think you want on your oboe reed. And so the way that I use my knife, um, I use my thumb. It just kind of sits against my thumb nice and straight like that. And then I use my wrist of my right hand to rotate back and forth. Um, my left hand really doesn't do a whole lot other than hold that blade exactly where I want it. Get the corners nice and even. Much better. Check it with the light. Make sure everything's nice and even. Don't want any thick spots or thin spots. Just nice and easy. I'll try to show you what I mean by that. I'm done here. Alright, so I'm going to attempt this. I don't know how easy it's going to work. Um, but with the light you can see that V shape on both sides and you can see where the dark spots are where they're darker shaded um, so I'll just go back and touch those up a little bit um, now with the tip it's not fully open you can kind of see the fibers um, there and can kind of see where it's open there um, so basically what I'll do is I will put these back on the drawing board and here in a few hours I'll come back and we'll do the next step so I'm getting ready to do the next step, which is clipping the tip and then finishing up the reed. Um, the reeds have been drying overnight, um, so it's always better to leave the the cane to rest longer than to hurry up and rush it, um, because we want the, the cane to really settle into the shape that it's going to stay in for the rest of its functioning life, if you will. So what I need to do in order to clip the tip is I've got this, it's called a wood block. Um, they come in different sizes. This is my biggest one, it's my also my favorite one. And then I've got one that's a little bit thicker and a little bit shorter, or a little bit uh, more narrow, and it's a little bit harder of a, um, it's a little bit heavier, it's a little bit harder of a wood. And then I've got one that's really tiny, it's absolutely useless. I don't know even where it's at because it's so, it's so small you can't really do much with it. And then I've got um, one that's actually plastic that I have also not found that I like. It's also quite a, quite a bit smaller. Um, it would be easy to, to take somewhere, I guess. Um, and then I also will need a razor blade. And I'm going to be using a new one because I need it to be super sharp in order to cleanly cut through the tip. Um, I have only cut myself once and it wasn't very bad and it was with a reed knife and it was when I was um, finishing up the tip is when I cut myself and I was probably early high school when I did that. Alright, so just randomly choose one out of the ones that I have soaking here. And these are all ones that I did yesterday. I haven't fudged anything. I haven't replaced any of them. This is what I did yesterday. And this one may be an interesting one to start with because I um, took a chunk out of it yesterday. So we'll see what happens here. And so I'm clipping just the very tip. I know it's really hard to see, um, but I'll only be taking off about that much. It's really not much at all. Um, and the, what I'm doing is just basically um, opening up that tip. So when I folded it over and shaped it, um, the fibers were still connected. And so I'm just remo removing those fibers that um, held that tip together. And so now it's nice and open. The next thing that I'm going to do is um, making sure that it creates a seal. And the way that I do this is I'll plug the end of it uh, with my finger just like this, and I'll suck in from the other end. And what I'm looking for is um, 
no air leaks, so it should create a suction. So when I release either my mouth or my finger, it should create, create a popping sound. Um, so I'll go ahead and try that now. And we have a good seal. It made a nice popping sound. Um, so that is good and open. Everything is good to go with this reed for the next step. Um, I will be using a plaque, which I usually have a whole collection of them on my desk here, and I'm not finding them. So I'll have to do some digging in order I to find them. I found one in my big reed bag, or in my big uh, instrument bag. This is a plaque, and um, the ones that I use are extremely flexible. They're made out of um, a very thin steel, and it bends pretty easily. There's different kinds and different styles um, that you can use. Um, it really just depends on the preference of the reed maker. Um, these are the ones that I have found that I like the best because they move with the cane. You don't have to fight them. They bend easily, so you know it's it's not like you've got something very very hard in there. Um, I found that the harder the plaques, the easier it is for that um, cane to split. And once that cane splits, then you can't use it anymore. So I found that the, the flexible ones are my favorite to use. Um, I was trying to see if I could find the other ones that anyway, I have here. Um, once I find them all, I'll do something, I guess. So anyway, um, basically what happens is once we've clipped that tip open, it's nice and open. I can put the plaque in, and it gives me a steady work surface, and I can also see um, the blades of the tip a little bit better, so you can see kind of the black shining through there. Um, that tells me what what is thin, what is not. Um, so I'll go ahead and work on the tip now, and we've already got it started where you have that nice shallow V, and so I'll just continue with that and get it down to the thickness that I need um, all the way through. For me, this is the hardest part, just because if your knife isn't sharp enough, or if the cane isn't fully soaked all the way, um, it's super easy to just completely destroy the reed, um, and take a big, too big of a chunk out, or, you know, have too much pressure. Um, so this is, for me, this is the hardest part. So, there's what it looks like right now on that side kind of uniform all the way through, whereas this side there's still big chunks that need to be taken off. And with this reed, um, like I said earlier, when I was scraping the tip before it dried, um, I took a big chunk out of the corner, but I think it'll be okay because I've still got a little bit more work to do at the very tip, so I think it'll be alright. I'm not too worried about it. Um, there's a possibility that, you know, I'll screw it up further and it won't be usable. For different parts of the reed, I use different parts of my knife. Um, when I've got a really small detailed area, so like the very corners of the reed here, I use the tip because I've got more control, it's more precise. Um, when I know that I've got a big chunk to to take off or that I know that it's pretty thick and I'm going to be scraping on it for a little bit. I use the back part of the handle, the back part of the knife where it's closer to the handle just because I have more leverage I can get in a little bit deeper and it won't take quite so long. Alright, so for me that's pretty close to what I'm needing. Um, take a little look at it through the light here just to see where my dark spots are. My dark spots are exactly where I expected to see them. Um, so I'll just work a little bit more in those areas. Alright, that's more more uniform in the brightness there. So I'll just pop that one back right up in the water. And I don't want it to fully soak, so I'll just put it on the drying board. Um, so that it can just wait its turn for the next time that I need to, to work with it. 
and I'll continue clipping the tips and I'll join you next time for the scraping of the spine and the rails. Alright, so um, when I was checking this reed for being able to seal, it did not pass. Um, so what I, what basically what that means is when I plug up the hole and I suck in, I can get air in and I can also hear a whooshing sound. Um, if I blow out, then you can start to see little bubbles form um, right here around the top where it didn't completely seal. And so my remedy for that is good old super glue. Um, I've got a spot here on my desk that actually has a collection of super glue on it. So I'll just break the tip on that. And basically what I do is I apply, um, this is crazy glue and uh, it's got a fine little tip on it here. So basically what I do is I just press right there, spread that glue all the way up and all the way down. Um, the side of it where I know that the seal is probably being broken. Um, it's very hard to pinpoint exactly where the leak is at, but by applying super glue all up and down here, you're going to cover it up um, and apply as necessary. And so basically what I'll do is I'll just take this and I'll put it on my other drying board so that I know that it still has some work to do. Um, and then when it's dry, it'll seal up that, that leak and then I can continue, continue on um, making it. All right, so I am working on the last reed tip here. Um, out of eight reeds, I have had one that didn't seal and one that was kind of, um, it sealed, but only if the blades were a certain way. So I've gone ahead and fixed that one as well. Um, and I don't let these rest too long before finishing the tip and starting the, the rail and spine, which is why I'm flowing into this next part here while I'm working on this one. Um, I have had no reeds that I completely destroyed the tip, so all of these could possibly be good contenders for being a good reed. We'll just have to wait and see until the very end, I guess. At this point, um, most of the reeds should respond and create a sound, even with just the tip finished um, and no other part of the reed. Um, let's see if you can see the difference there. So the bark is still the shiny, thick stuff on bottom, and the tip is the really light part that has the um, the uh, light shining through it. And you can kind of see that it's a different um, texture where the bark which is the lower part right here, is still really smooth. This is still pretty rough because this is the meat. It's had the shiny stuff taken off of it. If you look into the profile, you can see that there's a difference in the shape as well, where it becomes thinner at the tip, which is what we're looking for. Um, it kind of has a duck shape to it because the V um, creates that, that shape where it tapers down. If you also look into the tip, I'll see how well I can do this here. If you look into the tip, you can see kind of that there's a flatter blade and a rounder blade. On this reed, it looks like the flatter blade is on the top, which means our reed is actually going to go like this, because we want the flat part of the cane to be on the bottom lip when we play it. So, we'll see if this one creates a sound. Um, I've got some, some uh, cane shavings in the tip here, so I'm going to try to remove those before I play this. So it does make a sound. Um, it's not going to make the sound that I'm looking for. Uh, the sound that I look for is when I put my lips all the way down to the thread and blow. It should create a sound that's called a crow, and it should be a series of three different tones. It should have a high tone, a mid tone, and a low tone. And this will probably just come out as a, as a squeak. I'll be very surprised if it comes out as anything else. 
So right now it's only got the high tone. Um, it didn't come out as a squeak, so I'm a little bit surprised by that. Um, but it did come out as the high tone, which means um, this one will probably be a very a pretty good reading by the time that we're done with it because it's already established um, a tonal center. So the next part that I will do is I'm just going to start off with the read that I used last. Um, put the plaque back in there just so that I have an extra layer of stability here. I'll take the reads that have had the clips tipped and the tips done, dunk them in water just for a little bit because it doesn't need to be soaking wet, it just needs to be enough that when I scrape on it, it doesn't split. So the way that I create the rails and the spine. The spine is actually going to run from the tip of the Bart that's right here all the way down to about right there. And I'm gonna leave that as solid as I can. I don't wanna do a whole lot of scraping on that area. So I'll be scraping off onto the side that's right here and the side that's on here and that's gonna be on both sides and that's what are called the rails and the windows. Um, with more traditional read uh, making there's two distinct areas you can see them. With mine, it's a modified um, American scrape, which means that I still have the components that are just not as easily seeable, and um, it's not very common for that spine and um, for that spine to be there on both sides, um, and for the windows to be all the way up. So I start just a few millimeters from the bottom, and I'll scrape straight up. trying to avoid the spine area as much as possible. I did get into it this one just a little bit, so I'll just have to avoid it um, a little bit more carefully next time. And as you scrape away the layers of the meat, it turns first into a white color, and then as you scrape down, it turns back into the goldish tone that the bark was. Um, you can kind of see the white area right there. I've just scraped away the very top layer of that bark. I'm just going to keep scraping on it and it eventually will turn back into that gold color. All right, so, almost there, sorry. All right, so I've got the basic outline of the windows. You can see that spine that's really strong right through the center there that runs from the thread all the way up into the heart. That heart is at the very tip of the, of the V that we created. Um, so those are my windows, they're on both sides. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna test the reed. And remember, I'm looking for those three tones. I'm looking for the high tone, the mid tone, and the low tone. And I'm going to guess that the low tone is probably not there because I didn't do a whole lot of scraping in the lower part of the reed. So I'm getting still just the, the high tone. Do a little bit of scraping down in the lower part. So to get the low tone to come out, I just scrape in the very part, very bottom part of those windows that I just created. It allows the vibrations to travel down there. Whatever you do on one side, you always do on the other. And we'll try that, that crow again. That's still not creating it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clip the tip just a little bit more. And part of the... Sometimes you'll get some pieces of cane in your mouth, which is not a pleasant experience. Um, so I'll just go ahead and clip that tip. So there at the very beginning I, I got um, two of the tones. Just do a little bit of evening out. Um, so what's basically happening is that there's a, a thick spot somewhere in this in this reed that's not allowing the air and the vibrations to travel all the way down to create the other tones. I 
And at this point, it's pretty much just a guess and check. There's not an exact science to it. Um, there are places that, obviously, we know the first places are to check. But every time it's different, every read is different, um, every read maker is different. So it's kind of, you diagnose the symptoms and you treat what you think is the illness. And now I'm not getting anything. And there I got all three tones in the crow. So this one is um, ready to be tested on oboe once it dries and gets re-soaked. So I'll just set this one off to the side, let it dry some more. Um, by the time that I'm with all the other ones, it should be ready to be soaked up again, and then I'll try it on my oboe. So the reeds have been made, they've been clipped, they've been scraped. Everything has been done. The last thing to do is to make sure that they play in tune and to make sure that everything responds that I, the way that I want it to. Um, so the cane and the reed have been, no, well, the reeds now, have been soaking for a couple minutes. And we don't want to soak them any longer than that, and it's always soaked in water. Got a good seal on this one. The tip looks a little long, so I'm expecting this one to play flat. And it is. So what I do is I clip the tip um, to get pretty much in tune. Um, we look for an A to play a steady A440. And sometimes when I clip the tip, it, it hardens the reed back up, so I'll have to go back and scrape some more, some more cane off of it. The low notes are hard to respond, the mid's hard to respond, it's all a little stiff still. So I put the plaque back in, I take my knife, and I scrape just a little bit more off of it. And looking at this reed, um, there is a small split on this side. Um, it doesn't seem to affect it too much, so I'm not going to do anything with it, I'm not going to touch it, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, this will be a reed that I keep for myself because I wouldn't want to sell um, or that could potentially not last very long to a student because then that's just frustrating and if they're spending money on something they expect to work then you know they expect it to work. So I'll just keep this read for myself and uh, I've got a couple performances coming up that I'll probably use it on. It's got a good crow. plays in tune so I'm going to leave it and I'll continue doing the same thing to the other seven reads. So after going through my reads um, and testing all of them and just seeing if I like how they respond and everything, um, out of the eight that I started with, all eight of them play. I had them divided into two groups here. Um, this group of six over here um, on the flower pedestal, this one right here, um, those are all reads that I am really comfortable playing. They respond really easily for me. Um, they feel good. Um, I know that sounds kind of like a weird term to use, but you can tell when a read um, is exactly what you want. And six out of the eight are exactly what I look for in a read. Um, these two over here on the square pedestal, um, they're a little too soft for me. I don't feel like there's enough resistance for me. Um, so those are reads that um, I will package and sell. And the six over here, I'll, um, between me and the students that I supply reads for, um, those are where those six will go because I know that their strength that they need for their read is about where mine is as well. Um, so I hope that this kind of sheds some light on um, what it is that I do and how I make the reads. Um, if you have any questions, I guess ask me in class. Have a good night, guys.